All right, I'm gonna uh, try wait. my best to keep the, oh, go ahead. No, I just said that we're ready. <laughs> okay. We're seeing, your entire, we're seeing your entire screen, David. Is that what you wanted? Yes. Uh, I'm going to try my best to be a good Twitch streamer and keep an eye on chat. So I'll tuck that into the corner there. Um, if I miss something in chat, please tell me. Uh, yeah, so um, I'm going to be doing a deep dive into OCIM. Um, my name is David Niesmanger. I'm the uh, I'm the lead for Private Automation Hub, um, as well as the author of OCIM. Um, so yeah, we'll go ahead and get started. <coughs> This is our agenda for today. Um, I'm going to be doing a, a brief introduction to you know, what is OCIM. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about how OCIM works under the covers, uh, and then talk some more about the profile system in OCIM. All right, so what is OCIM? <laughs> I imagine a lot of you are familiar with this already. I, most of you have used the environment uh, in one way or another. Um, but I want to go over this to kind of level sit for everyone, uh, just in case someone hasn't. So OCIM is a, is a pulp developer environment, um, which is uh, to develop pulp images, or sorry, to develop pulp using the pulp all-in-one images. Um, it uses uh, Docker or Podman as sort of a container runtime to run uh, the all-in-one images uh, in kind of a developer mode, uh, and I'll get into that a little bit later. And it's based off of the developer environment that we built for Galaxy NG. Um, it's a little bit, it, well, it's a lot more advanced than the one we had for Galaxy NG. Um, the Galaxy NG one that we had was just a bash script with a make file. Um, but this environment has a, its own CLI and a bunch of other goodies. Um, so some, some major selling points for this environment. Uh, it's got fast load times, um, sub two minutes spin up, um, depending on your internet connection and some other factors. It's got cut auto code reloading. Um, it's got out of the box support for running functional integration and unit tests. Uh, it's got some helper functions for working on pulp. Uh, it supports Podman and Docker. And one of the new things that I'll talk about is multi-environment support. I'm gonna skip this slide for a second. Um, so we'll start off with a demo of the basics. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and set up our environment here. Um, one tip that I don't know a lot of you, if, if any of you know about this or not, but you can set up your OCIM path environment variable. Um, so if I, if I echo mine. You can see that this is a path to uh, my checkout of OCIM. What this allows me to do is run the command from anywhere, so I don't have to be in the OCIM directory. Um, and it will default to the compose environment uh, file that you have in there. Um, so that's just a nice little trick to have. Um, so the first thing that we're going to do is set up our uh, compose environment file. So we'll go ahead and copy this, uh, the example one that we have here, and rename this compose.m. Um, this used to be a hidden file, and uh, Matthias requested that we change it. So I changed it. <laughs> it's now uh, not hidden anymore. Um, we're going to ignore most of the stuff here. Um, you, you can set a lot of things here. You can set some environment variables uh, in uh, your environment if you want, so you can con add pulp configurations that way. And then there's a whole host of settings uh, like port and uh, username and password for the admin user. We're going to ignore all of that for now. Um, the only thing that we really need at the moment is uh, these three settings up here. Um, you actually don't even need the Compose profile. I'm going to leave it there just for later. Um, since I'm using Docker, I also need this Compose binary. Uh, and then the last thing here is your dev source path, which is the plugins that you want to include um, from source. Uh, so these are plugins in, or th these are these are directories in uh, the same directory structure as uh, OCIM. Um, so I'm going to be including pulp core and pulp file, which you can see that I have here already. So we'll go ahead and put pulp core and colon um, to separate the two ones, um, pulp file. All right, now that I have that set up, um, I can come in here and I can run OCIM compose up. Uh, and I'm going to throw this dash V flag in here as well. Um, so what this will do is it will launch the uh, environment 
Um, this will take a few minutes to start up. Um, I don't know why, but I have this bug on mine where the generating certs just takes forever. I don't know if that's something everyone else sees or not. Um, but the dash V flag is helpful because it, it, it'll tell you what commands are being run in the uh, in the Docker Compose or Podman Compose uh, script. Um, so you can see here, it spits out running command to container. Uh, and then, so this is the command that's actually getting run under the hood. It's Docker Compose um, dash P, which sets the project name, um, and then dash F, which specifies the compose file. And I'll talk a little bit more about how this gets generated later, and then up. Um, so this compose command here just passes commands to Docker or Podman Compose. So you can use any Docker or Podman Compose from here. All it does is add some extra helper stuff um, so that you don't have to figure out which compose file you're using. All right, uh, while this is spinning up, this is gonna take a little while to install some dependencies and run migrations and stuff. I'm gonna go back to the slide that I skipped. Um, so kind of the philosophy of this project is sort of the same philosophy of the Ansible project, and that's to make the easy things hard and the hard things possible. Um, and so that has uh, two uh, kind of implications for the project here. The first is that everything must work out of the box with the least possible number of configurations and commands for a developer to go from forking a pulp plugin to writing code. Um, so if you look at the um, if you look at the readme file uh, for OCI um, there's only a few steps to getting started. You have to install the the uh, Python client, um, which is just a pip install. You have to install Podman or Docker. Granted, there's some devil in the details here. This can sometimes be a little bit difficult to set up. Um, and then after that, you really just have to clone OCI env into the same directory structure where you have all your other plugins, um, set up the, the plugins that you want to uh, work with in your dev source path, and then run the compose up command. Um, that's kind of the basic path that we're working here with here. And that should get you pretty far. The other, the other thing that this means for us is that the system has to be flexible enough to allow for a wide variety of development modes. So I should be able to develop uh, using like an S3 backend really easily, um, or using the Galaxy NG UI, or using Keycloak for authentication. And I'll get into how we accomplish this a little bit more later. So I'm going to switch back to my terminal here. Uh, I'm going to use a new command, OCIM poll to see if our thing is up. Um, and this will just keep following the API until it's ready. Looks like we are ready. Uh, so I'm going to go on to the next part. Um, you can run tests fairly simply in OCIM. Um, we have commands for generating the bindings and for running the actual tests. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. OCIM generate client, I think it's right. Minus I tells it to install the bindings, and minus P um, is the oops, is the uh, I can't talk and type at the same time. Minus P is the uh, plugin that we're going to generate the bindings for, and I did that wrong. It's, uh, oh no, sorry. You don't use the P flag. Uh, you just pass it as an argument. Uh, so this will go ahead and generate our bindings um, using the pulp open API generator, which we have cloned here. Um, those will end up. Uh, the bindings will end up um, getting generated onto your computer here, which is really helpful because you can just use your editor and go through and inspect them. So I could go through and uh, take a look at what bindings are being generated by uh, Open API in here, which I find really helpful. I, I end up going through these a lot when I'm trying to debug tests. Um, yeah, so that. I just want to yeah. throw in a comment that we have started publishing documentation for the bindings. It's not very clearly linked on our site, but just like you can look up documentation for each plugin, you can put in like pulp underscore file underscore client and find the documentation for the bindings there, which is also helpful when debugging stuff. Anyway, go ahead, continue. No problem. <clears throat> so the next thing I'm going to do is run some tests. I'm going to run some functional tests. Um, the command for that looks like this. Um, so OCIM test, uh, and then the dash I flag tells you to install the uh, dependencies for your plugin, uh, the functional test dependencies. P specifies the plugin that we're going to be testing. And then we can either put in functional unit lint um, 
big functional unit in, in lint here. Uh, so we're going to be running the functional tests. And then anything after this gets sent to um, PyTest. Uh, and I'm actually going to add the V flag on here so we can see what's going. Uh, so in this case, I'm going to pass in the K flag, and I'm just going to do the test labels. Uh, so we'll hey, go David. ahead and run that. Yep. Um, so one thing I wanted to point out is that this dash I, or I guess confirm, is that um, so it it pulls its dependencies for tests from this convention in our repositories, right? That has this test underscore requirements dot text. Is that right? Yep, absolutely. So it'll okay, cool. it'll find the uh, functional func test requirements dot txt file under pulp file and install that. Okay, great. So something to know for everyone who's a pulp developer is that. Um, when your stuff has been running, your, these files might be out of date for you. And so this might cause problems if they're not up to date, because then when you try to run them in the OCIM, they won't work. And you might ask yourself, why? How, how's this possible? Because it works great on the CI. And the answer is because you've been benefiting from the CI installing lots and lots of things, not actually using these files. And so our house is a little bit out of order in this area. And that is something to know about when you experience problems in this step. Um, these it pulls it from this area, and it's important that plugins keep this area up to date. Yeah, we run into problems with this for some plugins. We're like, uh, we we don't have all the requirements for unit tests in the unit test requirements, um, and so we've been adding those little by little. Um, yeah, so we can see we've run the tests here. Um, it, we can see that our command that was run is docker exec, um, and we're calling bash inside the container with this script for running functional tests. And you can see here, we're just passing uh, the rest of the arguments to uh, to PyTest. So you could do other arguments like dash v if you wanted more uh, verbose output. Um, so if we do that, then oops, I shouldn't have installed it again. <laughs> um, then we'll get uh, more verbose output when uh, the tests are running. Um, I'm going to go ahead and skip this because it's not that important. Uh, so the next thing I wanted to talk about is uh, the shell command. Um, so we've got this OCI env shell. By default, this will just drop you directly into the container that Pulp is running in. Um, so we can like do ls and look around here. Uh, one thing that's helpful to know is that all of the all of the code that you have gets mounted into source. So if I go to CD source here, uh, you can see that I've got pulp core, pulp file, uh, and some other junk that I've got in my environment here. Um, one other thing that a lot of people don't know is you can also use this shell command to get into other shells as well. So I can do OCIM shell DB, and this will take me into Postgres. Maybe, there we go. So we can take a look at Postgres, and we can do OCI and shell Python. And this will take us into the pulp core uh, Python shell. Uh, the last thing is you can also easily reset the uh, uh, database here with the OCI and DB reset command. Um, so this will, you can see our, our services in the container are shutting down here. Uh, and this will uh, drop the database and then rerun the migrations and create our user and all that good stuff. All right, so the next thing I want to talk about is running multiple environments. So this is a new feature that I don't know if anyone else is using other than me at the moment, but I wanted to shout it out. Um, so you can run multiple environments at the same time right now. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and set this up and explain what's happening. So first thing I'm going to do is just create another end file. Uh, I'm going to do this in the OCIM folder. And we'll call it second.compose.m. Uh, you don't have to add the .compose.m, but you'll notice that this is grayed out here. Um, so our, our git um, ignore basically ignores anything that has .compose.m or compose.env at the end. So if you want to have a, a bunch of uh, kind of custom profiles or custom environment settings uh, in your local environment, you can do that. So we'll go ahead and copy this in here. And I'm going to spin this up and explain what's happening. So we'll do OCI M and then use the dash E flag. And this allows us to specify another environment file. So we'll do second compose.env. And then after here, it's all the same commands. So we'll do compose up. 
And this will go ahead and start in the background. And while that's running, I'm going to talk through this a little bit. Um, so there's there's two things that, um, or I guess three things that you can configure for multi-environment support. The first thing is you need to make sure that you don't have conflicting ports. Um, so you can set the API port to a different one here. I've selected 402. The next one is you have to set a different compose um, project name. Um, so we're going to call this one my second env. And then the last one is you can set a source directory for your code um, that's different from the current source directory that you're in. Um, so I've set this to source path two. And if we take a look at this in my editor here, you can see that I've got another checkout of pulp file. So I'm going to come down here and do Docker PS. And now you can see we've got two instances of OCI env running. Um, this one has the my second env uh, project name, and this one has the OCI env project name which is the default. Uh, and then I can also come into uh, source path to pulp file. And here, my pulp file is running in an older version. So I'm at 1.11.2. Uh, you, can, you can access any uh, command from uh, this new environment using the dash e flag. So I can do uh, oops, second compose.m and then shell. And this will drop us into the shell for our new environment. And we can go to uh, the source directory and see that right now we've only got pulp file because we switched to the source directory. Um, let's see, I think it might be ready. Uh, so I'm going to take us to uh, status. So this is the one that I sped up, sped, sped, spun up first. It's got the default port, which is 5001. And we can see we're running pulp uh, file 1.2. If I go to localhost 4002, we should hopefully see that uh, we're running on 1.11 here. So I've got two instances of pulp running side by side. I could use these for syncing or whatever I want. Um, it, it's we're, we're going to be using this for testing syncing from uh, an automation hub between uh, our mode that we use for deploying on insights and our mode that we use um, for on-premise development. Um, one last thing while I'm in the shell here, we also have uh, support for the pulp command. So I can do pulp status and get my status message in here as well. Shout out to Matthias for contributing that. All right, uh, that is it for my multi-environment demo. So I'm going to go ahead and kill these and tear them down. All right, now, now I want to talk a little bit more about how OCIM works under the hood. Uh, so the basic thing that it does is, I'm going to double check check, because I see some chatting there. Uh, it doesn't look like any questions. Um, so uh, the basic thing that it does is it builds a custom image off of the pulp all-in-one containers that contain the necessary utilities for running the dev environment. After that, it generates a set of Docker or Podman compose files for launching the environment. And then it uses the generated compose files to start and interact with the containers. So I'll take a look at each one of these steps individually. This is the container file that we're using um, to run everything. You can see we, we use the Pulp CI CentOS latest as our base image. Uh, there's a couple of modifications that we're making to it. The first one is uh, keeping the environment variables. So this allows us to configure the containers using environment variables instead of just the settings.py, which is really helpful because you can pass environment variables directly into your compose uh, files. Um, we're installing a couple of dev dependencies. This is for running unit tests um, and for setting up like the Pulp CI, CLI and stuff like that. Uh, we're setting up our settings.py file. You do have to have a settings.py file. So even though we're using environment variables, that still has to be there. Um, the next thing we're doing is setting up some S6 stuff. Um, so this OCI and prepare uh, job will take all of the plugins that you have listed in your uh, dev source path and install them from source. Um, and then uh, the profiles one will kind of initialize each profile. And I'll get on that a little bit later. After that, we're just modifying some of the existing X6 services to allow for like code reloading and a couple of other goodies. Um, so that's our container file. It's pretty basic. It just it takes the basic all-in-one images and modifies them a little bit. 
Uh, the next is the base compose file. So this is what actually runs the uh, Docker image when it's generated. Um, and you can see here, we've actually got two services. We've got base and pulp. Um, the base one, all it does is build the image and then provide it. Um, so this, uh, we use the, the Docker file that I just showed you. Um, I should probably name this the container file, uh, but it is what it is. Um, and it passes in the, the uh, context for the location where OCI is installed. Um, so this, this all, all this does is build the, the image. You'll see this when you start up the system, you'll see that the base image starts and then exit, or exits right away. The second service here is, is the one that we're actually gonna be using. So this uses the image that was built in the pre with the, via the previous service. Um, we add some configurations in here to uh, support uh, some things in Podman. And then you can see we're passing in a, a bunch of different environment files. So the main one is uh, gonna be this combined.env, which contains the configurations from your profiles. And then you also pass in the um, environment configuration file, which allows you to set like different environment uh, variables for pulp here. Uh, and I'm not going to go into the rest of this, but you can take a look at it later if you want. Um, so the next thing that happens is is the compose files are are kind of compiled um, and generated in a way that uh, they can be launched. So if you take a look back here, you can see we've got these little, these template variables in everywhere. This step will take. Um, uh, sorry, I jumped the gun a little bit. Uh, the first thing that happens is we load the environment configuration file. So that's that's loading this environment configuration here, uh, which has all the information for the environment to spin up. Um, the second thing that happens is that the profiles that are listed here are are uh, parsed and then compiled. Uh, we don't have any profiles, so that's not happening. Uh, and then the last thing that happens is that we're compiling the uh, the the composed files uh, and making those runnable. So that's when we see the variable substitution happening on like the composed project name and the OCI directory and all these variables that get put into the compose uh, file here. And this is done using Python templates. Um, so we, we do the variable substitution, we create initialization script, and we create a settings file. And you can actually inspect all of these images by going to the compiled directory here that is kind of hidden under the OCI um, project. Uh, in here, you'll get a folder for each of the different environments that you're running. Um, so if we come in and look at my second M, for example, um, you'll see we have the base compose here, uh, which has all of our variables substituted incorrectly. So these correspond to systems on, or uh, folders on my file system. Um, we've got combine.m, which pulls in the environment uh, variables from our different profiles. Um, and then we've got init.sh, which uh, this will run when the containers start up and just perform some tasks to initialize things. Right now, this is only going to be uh, doing the, the base initialization script here. So that's kind of what's happening here. We, we generate this compiled.env file, uh, which has our compose files in it, and uh, use that to launch and interact with the service. Uh, and you can you can see. Is there a question? Yeah, I was just going to confirm that each of these uh, deployments has its own database. And they might yeah. share code if you have it set up that way. But they will have their own database, and they will have, you know, will run independently. Yeah, that's correct. So if you, if you look at the compose file here, you can see we've got the compose project name in all of our volumes. Um, so those will get namespaced by uh, the project name that you provide. Cool. Yeah, and I can see this being really useful to actually have like three environments <laughs> running all the time. One that has the regular file system, one that's using S3, and one that's having Azure um, or the SFTP. And so you can test your things, you know, with the different uh, storage backends. Yeah, and you can also test syncing them between each other. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, Lubos, Lubosh asks. Uh, can profiles be used for adding support for third-party storage backends? Yes, I will get to that in a minute. I'm going to I'm going to be walking people through how to write um, profiles, and I think uh, Dennis is actually working on this right now, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I've um, only filed issues, and Jared, I believe, and, well, I know Lubosh and Michal are working on it. Okay, somebody's working on it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
Not me. Um, uh, so y you can you can see uh, the interaction with the compiled files happening when you run dash v flag. Um, so you can see that we're running Docker compose uh, and it's passing in dash f with uh, the pass to the um, the YAML file, uh, the compose YAML file in our dot compiled directory here. So that's kind of what's happening under the hood. It, is it's it's just running Docker and then passing in the correct flags to get the configuration files. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the OCIM CLI. Um, it, like I mentioned before, it's pretty simple. Um, all it really does is is execute Docker or Podman commands. Um, so it. Well, okay, it, it does, there's kind of three things that it does. The first one is, is you can uh, execute Docker or Podman commands using the compose uh, subcommand here. And that basically translates um, OCI and compose into Podman compose or Docker compose with whichever args you pass to it. So we saw that a little bit earlier. The second thing it can do is execute commands inside of the containers. Um, and these can either be scripts, which are found in base slash container scripts. So if you wanted to add a command to OCIM that has um, that does something inside of the container, uh, one really easy way to do that is add those scripts into the container scripts directory here. Um, we've got helper functions that can just execute those out of the box. Uh, so that's really handy. Um, and you can also do direct commands. So like as an example, if you do the DB reset command, you can see that it's uh, running um, the uh, container script slash database reset uh, from inside the container. Uh, and if you're running something like OCIM shell, it will uh, run docker exec minus it uh, and then bash inside the shell. Um, the last thing it does is it can also execute commands locally on the host machine. We don't do this very much, and I try to avoid it as much as possible because, again, getting back to that simplicity idea, like things should just work out of the box as much as possible. Um, we, we want to avoid executing scripts on the host machine as much as possible because the host machine is going to be different for every person. Um, but there are some cases where we have to do that, and one of those is uh, generating the clients. Um, so we've got this other directory in here for local scripts, uh, and the one that we use right now is generate client. So that will run on your host machine. Um, if you execute that with the dash V flag, you will see that it's running uh, this command locally on your computer. Um, one other note about this, uh, the OCIM CLI, it's written in Python, and I've gone out of my way to make sure that it doesn't have any dependencies because I want it so that when you install it, it just works out of the box as much as possible. Um, I, I, I like to avoid uh, dealing with dependency conflicts and different versions of Python, different versions of dependencies and whatever. Um, so that's that's another thing that to keep in mind when you're working on this is like the, the OCIM command itself should just work out of the box as much as possible with as few dependencies as possible. All right, now we're going to talk about profiles. Um, Profiles are one of the more exciting things, I think, about OCIM. Uh, and so I'd like to uh, show you guys how to write them and talk a little bit about what they do. And Lubach, this is where your, your questions will get answered. So profiles are a system to easily configure the development environment to operate in different deployment modes. Now, when, you, when I say configuration, people probably are going to be thinking, well, we're just changing things in settings.py. Um, but it's more than just that, because when you're when you're deploying in different deployment modes, um, you're gonna you're gonna need to change more than just settings. You're gonna be able, you're gonna want to um, run extra services alongside pulp, um, and so profiles allow you to do that. You can spin up other containers that let you say have an S3 storage bucket or keycloak authentication, or in the case of Automation Hub, our web UI. Um, you can also specify uh, configurations for pulp as environment variables. Um, and you can also run arbitrary bash scripts, which is helpful because it lets you set up objects in the database or install extra dependencies if you want. All right, so we're going to write a new profile together. Um, our goal is, because I'm really lazy, uh, I want to launch a file server alongside pulp file that I can use to sync pulp file tests. Uh, so, so that I can so that I can use to test pulp file syncs. Um, so our, our profile is going to launch up another service um, as a web server that has some files running on it and automatically generates our pulp manifest for us. 
So first thing we're going to do is we're going to use the OCIF command to create a new profile. So I'm going to do OCI, OCI env, uh, prof, profile init dash p. And the dash p will specify the plugin where the profile gets uh, created. And then fs is the name of uh, the profile. So that stands for file server. So I'll go ahead and create this. And it says no new profile is successfully created, and it tells us where. So this is actually going to be generated in the pulp file um, project here. You can see it went ahead and created a profiles directory for us, and then pre preset the profiles, uh, the, the profile directory with all the different files that we need. So I'll walk you through those really quickly. The first one is the README. Um, this is user written documentation for the profile. Um, I highly recommend that you add some uh, documentation to your profile. Uh, profiles can have extra variables, so it's good to document those here. Um, and it's it's helpful to have like a description of what this does and maybe talk about what services it launches and stuff like that. Um, the second one is a compose.yaml file. Um, this is a way to define any new services that the profile provides, and this will get launched alongside the base uh, compose profile as well. Um, the next one up is an init script, and this is basically any arbitrary batch that you want to run when the container is initialized. Um, next up, we have profile requirements.txt. Um, profiles can you, you can you can launch more than profile one profile at once, and there are some cases where you might want to have profiles depend on other profiles. Um, we do this in Automation Hub quite a bit, where like we've got a base profile for Automation Hub that configures it just the way we want it, and then we've got other profiles that change different things, like how the authentication works and uh, whether we're running in standalone mode or in cloud mode. Um, so. If your profile requires another profile, you can you can list those in here. Uh, I don't suspect people use this too much, but it's helpful for us on the Galaxy side. Uh, and then the last one is your pulp config.env. This is where you set your environment variables for the profile to run. So this is how you, you kind of do your settings.py configuration. All right, let's go ahead and write some stuff. So the first thing we're going to write is our compose.yaml file. What this is going to do is um, it's just a Docker or Podman compose file. Um, and it's going to build our file server uh, from this Docker file that we've had listed here, so container file. Um, and that container file is going to be located in the source directory uh, slash pulp file slash profiles dot slash fs. Um, so, uh, and we're going to export expose this on port 8001. Um, and then we're also going to mount a variable called web server directory into our web server root inside of Apache. So I'm going to go ahead and copy this, come down to the profile, and paste this in here. Next up. Um, so we saw we created this container file here, or we, we defined this container file here. We need to actually create the container file as well. Um, and this will just live in our profile directory. Um, the container file is going to be very simple. It all it does is it installs um, the HTTPD um, container image from the Docker registry. Uh, we added some extra things in here to install um, Python inside of our Alpine image, and then to install a pulp manifest. And then the last thing that we're doing is that we're adding this this command sh as our entry point into this container. So we'll go ahead and copy this. We'll create our container file. and paste in our commands here. So next up, um, we do have to create this command.sh. Um, so we're just going to go ahead and put that in the same directory, um, because we're, this is one of the things we're copying into our container file here. Um, this is very simple. All it's going to do is run pulp manifest on the web server root, and then launch uh, the web server. So we'll go ahead and do this, new file cmd.sh, and pop that in there. Next up, um, we've got our init.sh file. Um, so what we're going to be doing here is using the, the pulp file, or, or the pulp command, the pulp CLI, to create a remote for our new um, server. I'm super lazy, so I don't want to have to do this every time I, I start up my uh, developer environment. Um, so this will create a 
this will create a remote for us using the URL for our file server. And note here that we're using file server on port 80. One of the really cool things about Compose is it will actually network all of your containers together. So if we come back to our compose.yaml file, you can see that we've named our service file server. Um, so that, that service will be accessible via the host name file server from any of the other containers in our Compose system. Um, so we can reference that from inside of Pulp using file server on port 80. So we'll go ahead and pop this into our init file here. And then the last thing we're going to do is we want to allow SHA-1 um, checksums. Uh, I don't you don't really have to do this for anything, but I wanted to demo setting up the config environment file. And this was one of the ones that I, uh, one of the configurations that seemed to make sense. Um, so we'll go ahead and pop that in our pulp config.env. All right, so we've got our environment set up. Um, we've got our, our new services defined. We've got our init script. I'm not going to bother with updating the readme, but you totally should if you're going to write a profile. <laughs> um, so do as I say, not as I do. Uh, all right, now the last thing that we need to do is configure our environment uh, to use this new profile. So we're going to do two things here. I'm going to go ahead and copy this. Um, the first is we're going to set our profile to pulp file slash fs. So this will tell OCIM to, to go into the pulp file plugin and then load the fs profile. And then the second thing we're going to do is define our web server directory. Um, so if you remember back here, we defined a custom uh, variable in our compose.yaml. Um, this is where we have to actually set up that uh, in our configuration. And OCI will warn you if you forget to do this and tell you to go set it up. Um, this is going to set this is going to point to uh, my pulpcon slash web server uh, directory here. Um, which we can take a look at. We've got uh, one file in our uh, web server right now, friday.txt. All right, so with that, we should be good to go ahead and launch the system. So I'm going to go ahead and do OCI and compose build. And we have to do build because we defined a new service that has to get built. Um, so you can see it's building the file server. Uh, and then once that's completed, it will build uh, the base image. Uh, which the pulp service will use. So now we're going to go ahead and do OCIM compose up. I think I can close this other terminal now. Uh, and this will launch our pulp uh, service like we're used to. And you can see here, it also launches the file server. So we've got HTTPD running in the background. And if this is launched correctly, then it should have created our manifest file for us. So we can come and take a look at our web server, and we can see that we do indeed have a manifest file. Uh, since we exposed the port on this, we can actually come over to our uh, file or our uh, web browser here and go to localhost 8001, and we can see we've got our index. Um, so as this is starting up, I'm going to talk through some other things. Um, we can go ahead and shell into our environment. Um, so as I mentioned before, you can you can communicate to the other containers that are running in the Compose stack um, using the uh, service name. So we'll do HTTPD uh, file server port 80. And if we curl that, you can see we get the uh, index from our Apache server. Um, the other things that are happening here, so you remember how we talked about the compiled directory that creates those compiled um, YAML files. Uh, when you when you define a second um, when you define a second service running inside of, of uh, your YAML file, it, it creates another uh, entry here in this directory. So now we've got two compose files that are separate. Uh, I'll show a little bit how this works later, but both Podman and Compose and Docker Compose have a system where you can basically combine multiple compose files into one command, uh, which is really helpful because we don't have to merge these ourselves, uh, we can just let Podman and Docker do that for us. <clears throat> All right, so let's see if this is starting up. Do um, I have a question at that point. So yeah. when you write a service in a profile and you route it to a port, 
does that mean you can't use that profile in two environments at the same time? That's correct. Um, if I wanted to do this correctly, what I would have done is created another environment called file server port here. Um, and then I could have defined the file server port inside my compose environment as well. Um, so you have to be a little bit careful when you're launching extra services. Uh, ports can conflict. And so you just want to make sure um, that you're, you know, you're picking different ports, um, your, your namespacing your volumes correctly, if you're creating new volumes, that kind of stuff. Um, but the service itself is namespaced by the project name. Um, so if I come here and do Docker PS, you can see uh, we've got OCIM underscore file server. Thank you. Uh, it looks like we're online now. So we'll go ahead and come to our system here. You can see we're up. Um, now, you remember we put that in the init script uh, that we we're going to initialize our remotes and stuff. Um, so we'll come here, we'll log in. Uh, and now I can go to uh, remotes slash file slash file. And we've got a remote here that's pre-created for us um, that connects to file server on port 80 slash pulp manifest. Um, we've got a repository that is, there we go. We've got a repository that's connected to our remote as well. Uh, and I can just come in here with our PK and we could perform a sync if we want. So we'll go ahead and do that. And we can come back to the tasks API and see that our sync is done already. Um, yeah, one, I guess one of the last things I want to show here is, uh, so remember, you can do, with the compose command, you can do uh, whatever you want. Um, not whatever you want. With the compose command, you can, you can basically run any Podman or Docker compose script um, or subcommand. Uh, so let's say if I wanted to add a new file to my web server, let's say I like Friday so much uh, that I'm just gonna duplicate it. Um, our pulp manifest hasn't been updated. If I want to, I can restart the other service and remember when the other service restarts, it'll rerun pulp manifest. So I can do SCI uh, compose restart file server. Um, and this will just tell the file server to restart. So uh, you'll see that this uh, will pop up up here uh, once this is done. You see the file server exited and then restarted. Uh, and then when it restarts, it should regenerate our pulp manifest, which you can see what it did. Now we have Friday to copy and the original Friday. Um, so that's kind of the gist of writing profiles. Um, so some other things that I, I want to talk about Profiles can, and I would say should, be shipped with plugins. Um, so I remember when we generated our profile here, uh, we actually created it under the pulp file um, project. The idea here is prof profiles that are specific to different plugins should be shipped with their corresponding plugins because the requirements for the plugin can change over time as the code changes. So for example, like if we if if you guys decided to change pulp manifest, just be like manifest. Um, I would want to also go ahead and change that in my profile um, so that we're connecting to the right URL here. Um, so it's it's a good idea to ship plugin specific um, profiles with the plugin itself so that they can kind of track the changes of the rest of the code over time. Um, you can yeah. also ship. Go ahead. Yeah, the, uh, I have a question about the web server snippets that we have in different plugins. Mm -hmm. Right now, OCINs doesn't handle creating like sim links to them or like copying them over to the Nginx um, directory, the configuration directory. And I was wondering um, what the best way to do that is, is to have it be uh, Pro, as part of the profile for that plugin, or uh, do we just do something generic? Actually, it does handle it. Um, this was an update I made a little while ago. 
Um, we can't do sim links because you can't do a sim link from mm -hmm. uh, a mounted file system onto into the container. Yep. Um, but it does it does attempt to copy the uh, plugins app slash web server snippets into uh, nginx. So if I was running the Galaxy ng um, uh, plugin, for example, I would be able to get cool. my UI when, and everything running by default. That's cool. Uh, when did you add this, approximately? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's before I went on TTO. <laughs> OK, cool. Um, I, that's not been my experience, but I haven't pulled lately. So yeah, I'm going to check it out. Thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah. And but, so um, getting maybe, maybe in the same sense, would it be possible to have a default profile in a plugin that gets added automatically? Yeah, um, and I think that's actually a really good idea. Um, we have kind of this problem with Galaxy NG where like to run the Galaxy NG pro profile, you have to do a bunch of extra configurations. And so we have this base profile that all the other ones have to kind of build off of. Um, and so I think it, it, it it's it, something you could do is make it so that um, there's a default base profile for each plugin that just automatically gets included when uh, you include that in your source path. But uh, if someone wants to contribute that, I would love to see that. Um, any other questions? Um, yeah, so if you if you do the OCIM profile ls command, it'll show you the different pro, uh, profiles that are available um, for each plugin. Um, you can you can specify multiple profiles uh, by separating them with a col colon. Uh, Ina asks, what about profile specific settings? Um, plugin so specific. plugin specific settings. Um, you can put that in your uh, you can put those settings in your pulp config uh, .env file. So like uh, if I had like a base profile for pulp file. Um, and I needed to have a, I guess a good example of this is like Ansible, the pulp Ansible plugin has the Ansible URL path or whatever. Um, you can put that in your pulp config .env, uh, and then that will get included inside the environment. So if you have a if you have a if you have a, a setting like in pulp container, you need to have the um, uh, token server set up. Um, you can put in the configurations for your token server and all that stuff inside a profile for pulp container, um, and then that'll get configured whenever you use that profile. That sounds great. Does that answer your question? Yeah, you actually read my mind. I was referring to pulp container specific settings. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you can have multiple profiles um, they, that can inherit from one another. Um, so if I if we had an S3 profile, I could say, you know, run with S3, S3 backend and then also launch my file server. Um, so that's one thing that you can do. Um, the in terms of inheritance, um, the profiles later down the list have preference over the ones uh, further. So, like if I define two variables in both of these plugins, then the second one will in the list will uh, the later one in the list will get precedence over that. Um, I talked a little bit about how the multiple compose files work. Uh, so, under the hood, each compose file uh, that is generated in your compiled directory here um, will get included in the command uh, in the Docker Compose command with the dash F flag. Um, and what this does, this works the same in Docker Compose and Podman. Uh, dash F will take each of these compose files and then combine them as if they were one. Um, so that's that's a really handy thing that kind of allows all of this to work. Um, one of the things that you can do with this is you can actually override previous uh, services. So if I wanted to make the pulp image use a custom image, um, I could uh, create a profile that has uh, that defines the pulp service and then just changes uh, the image. And so what that would do is this would modify our base compose.yaml because we also define this pulp service here. Um, it would modify this so that it's using my custom image instead of uh, the one that's built for it. I'm not sure I would recommend doing this uh, because the OCIM CLI kind of expects the uh, container to be in a certain format um, with a certain set of files available. 
Um, but if you're smart about this, you can you can write profiles that actually override um, some of the things that are set in the in the kind of base service here. And I I actually have a profile that I use uh, just for personal development that makes it so that the images don't rebuild each time I <laughs> I run it because I found it annoying that every time there was a release um, for the CentOS CI yeah, image it was rebuilding it. Um, so I built a profile that uh, wouldn't do that. Um, I guess one other one last thing about profiles is in our Git ignore, um, anything that is underscore local here gets ignored by Git. So if you have a profile that you want to just write for um, your own development purposes, uh, you can totally do that. So OCI in profile in it, my profile underscore local. Um, and this will create a profile under the profiles directory that gets, get, that gets ignored by Git. Um, so I can do whatever dastardly things I want to my pull base service without having to share that with everyone else. Nice. Um, yeah, that's basically it. Uh, so we've got, uh, I guess, four minutes left for Q&A or maybe a break or something. I don't know. Back to you, Tanya. Um, yeah, one question. Uh, is renaming a profile as easy as renaming the directory? And the same goes for moving a profile to uh, a plugin? Yes and no. Um, so if your plugin defines a specific path, it's a little bit more complicated. Um, so for example, in the, uh, why is it not loading my, huh, OK, well, VS Code just broke. Um, if you remember in, uh, the plugin, that, the profile that we just created, um, we have this compose file that has to reference a Docker file, and so we have to we have to provide a uh, location for that Docker file in the FIOS system. And so this one has to be under source directory slash pull file slash profile slash fs. Um, so if you do move if you do move a profile that has something like this, you also have to remember to update these uh, directories. Um, but if your profile is just defining configurations or doing something simple, uh, you, you don't have to do anything else. Uh, and yes, I will. I will add the schedule or the slides to the schedule after this. Thank you. Yeah, and I've got no, just a general question. Am mm -hmm. I understanding correctly that the only disadvantage compared to a vagrant box is that there is no S3 storage backend support or Azure storage backend support? Um, I, That's basically the question? question to pulp developers, whether there are any other missing features compared to a vagrant box right now. Yeah, the storage backends um, are being worked on right now. And then there are um, there are problems. I, so one of, I, I just it's... filed an issue um, about the Gunicorn timeouts uh, being too short for whenever you're using a debugger. And, um, uh, and the way I would resolve that issue on the Vagrant box was by stopping the service and running it as a development Django server, you know, like Django admin run server. And that doesn't have a timeout. And right now, I'm not quite sure what the best way to do that in the OCIN. Um, but I think we can just set like a higher, like an hour or something timeout on the Gunicorn mm -hmm. process that are running in the um, container. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't know about the feature parity. Um, if you use the OCIN help. Uh, command you can see the sub commands that are available, so that might be a good starting point. Yeah, I think it's yeah. mostly Dennis. got feature parity except for those backends. But even those backends are, I would say, iffy uh, on the Vagrant environment. But yeah, those are the specifically the things to fill. Um, we yeah. have one posted for SFTP. There's a PR out there right now for Mikhail, which is great. And then so after that is going to be S3 and Azure. Yeah, and to answer a decorative Brito's question, um, can we easily plug those storage backends into the compose file? Uh, yes. So 
you can create um, a profile that has the services for running uh, different storage backends. So you could create a profile that, you know, instead of defining a file server for syncing content into pulp file, um, I could define a service that starts at min.io and then configures uh, pulp to connect to min.io for, uh, I don't know, do they provide S3 storage? Cool, thanks. I may start using OCM. Yeah, you should. Um, All right, are we done with the questions? I would like to stop the recording and maybe give a short break. Um, all right, let me do that. And David, thank you very much.